What's up, everybody? Sorry I'm a little late. Um, as most of you know, we are working on a new studio. And so we're kind of in a transitional phase. And we have some of the new stuff here. Um, but a lot of it is not here yet. So it has been interesting trying to get all this set up and use it a little bit differently while at home. And a couple meetings this morning went long, but we're here. We've made it. Um, and we're going to talk through Alec Murdoch's sentencing. And I thought it was just going to be, you know, we already know what he's going to get sentenced 27 years. It seems like everybody was on the same page, the lawyers, the judges, the victims, but it is, there's never a dull moment in this saga. And I think that there's a lot to be discussed. We're going to hear from the AG's office. We're going to hear from Murdoch's lawyers. We're going to hear from Eric Bland and Ronnie Richter and Tinsley and we're going to hear from some of the victims. We're not going to play the entire, you know, six hours of video that they have here. Um, but we are going to play some parts of it. We're going to talk through some stuff, some things that we can learn and what this is like for people to go through and why they do this, why they have victim impact statements. Then we're going to hear from Murdoch himself. Um, we're not going to listen to the entirety of it, but we're going to listen to what he says to the victims and potentially some of what he says to the judge. And we'll talk about how the things he says may affect the cases that are still ongoing against him. And then we'll finish with some interviews and the post court interviews to me shed light on a lot of the questions that you guys had. And it's going to answer a lot of the questions that you all had. So you guys should stick around to, um, listen to those interviews after court. If you didn't listen to them yesterday. So, Let's hit that like button if you guys haven't already. Um, I see that we have a gifted membership already. And Lily Wayne is freezing. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yes, it's like 50 degrees here in Florida, so it is freezing for us too. Not quite the same as one degree. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's get to the sentencing and we will work our way through it methodically, talking about everything that we find important and answering as many of your questions as I possibly can. It's not a great sign that my first timestamp is way off, but. So Creighton Waters starts out His going wife, through all of uh, the. The trust account check. Um, Charges against him yet again, which we don't need to hear. Maybe it was one good night. All right. This might take longer than expected because my timestamps were off. I want to get to Harputlian and what he says. Oh, come on. All right, forget it. So our Dick Harpulian stands up and basically says, Judge, there are lawyers here that have been selling shirts and bobbleheads and getting rich off of this case and getting famous off of this case. So we are going to ask that you let either the lawyers or the victims speak, not both. And they're going to say some besmirching things about me. Um, so just have them direct it to... Uh, Alec Murdoch or to the court, not to counsel specifically. The judge says, no, basically, I'm not going to let you block um, what it is that they want to say. Uh, the lawyers can speak. The victims can speak. And let's get this thing started and get this thing rolling. So Eric Bland starts us off with a bang. By the parties, it's, it sends um, a clarion bell signal to not only attorneys, but to anybody um, who wants to victimize the vulnerable. Um, this was predatory behavior. This wasn't Enron. It wasn't WorldCom. It wasn't stealing money from faceless people, from shareholders. This was Alex Murdoch stealing money from those that were closest to him. Gloria Satterfield, who broke bread with him and his family for 22 years, helped raise his kids. Jordan Jenks, that you'll hear from, lifelong friend, since they were eight years old, grew up, played ball together. This is close theft. This is the unicorn of all thefts. 
And, you know, he's on the Mount Rushmore of all criminals. He hit for the cycle. You know, he's convicted of money laundering, convicting of conspiracy, convicting of fraud. And most importantly, hit the home run. He was convicted of double murder. This is somebody that has tarnished our legal profession and tarnished our state. And, you know, we spent the past two years focusing on Mr. Myrtle. But today is when we focus on the victims and the impact that his actions have had on victims. I met you for the first time at the bond hearing in October of 2021. I had never had the honor of appearing before you. And during that hearing, I said to you that Mr. Murdoch needs to drink from the same cup of justice that every other criminal defendant has to drink from in our state. And I, I think. So Eric Bland, good attorney. Um, and he says he is a podcaster later in the interview and he drops this cup of justice line so many times throughout, which just makes me chuckle a little bit. It's the name of his podcast in case you didn't know today. He's getting that full cup. It's served hot. And I'm very proud of what our state has done. But now let's focus on the victims. My partner, Ronnie, and I have had the pleasure of representing Tony Satterfield and Brian Harriet, along with the siblings of Gloria Satterfield. We've <coughs> represented Alicia and Hannah Plyler, two sisters that you've heard about that were victimized by Alex Murdoch, Jordan Jenks. We represented Sandra Manning. Nobody ever heard of Sandra Manning. She was a sister of Gloria Satterfield. $28,000 was missing. She was also a victim of Alex Murdoch. We've represented Blake Hodge. Now, we've heard a lot of cases that talk about money theft, but there's a whole slew of other cases out there that deal with Mr. Murdoch taking their cases. Blake Hodge was a paraplegic. And guess what he didn't do? He didn't file the cases on time. And case was lost on the statute of limitations. Those are victims too. So it's not just that he steal their money, but he also blew their case, lost their case, lost them money, which although he didn't get the money, the clients still also didn't get the money because of Alec Murdoch, which is interesting. He committed malpractice in different ways, not just intentionally stealing money, but also negligently not doing his job as their lawyer, which I'm glad he pointed that out because I, I personally haven't heard a lot about that, that he was also just blowing cases and screwing them up and literally screwing over these people that needed the money and, and were damaged in a way that they can't come back from it without the money from the lawsuit for who was at fault for damaging them. So I'm glad he pointed that out. We've represented Melvick Edwards, who is the father of Hakeem Pickney. We talked a lot about Mrs. Pickney and Hakeem, but Hakeem had a father, Melvick Edwards. And there are some issues that concern that. So now I'm going to focus on Gloria, Gloria Satterfield, because that was the trial that we would be doing yesterday. We were going to start this trial. And Gloria, you know, I get very frustrated when I hear that she was just a housekeeper. Um, she was so much more than that. I think Alex would agree she was so much more than that. She helped raise their kids of Maggie and Alex's kids, Paul and Buster. She was a so we'll get to it. But Alec Murdoch, Bland said Gloria Satterfield helped raise his kids. He said, Me and Maggie raised those boys. It's like, okay, a good woman. She was a good mother to Brian and Tony. And um, Alex exploited that woman, the woman who was in his house, the woman who helped raise his kids. He exhibited this type of predatory behavior where these people are not as educated as he was and is as a former lawyer. And he knew that they had something valuable. And he believed that their cases were his cases instead of the cases belonging to the client. So I'm going to introduce Brian Harriet. I'm going to introduce Tony Satterfield to the court and to everybody here. They're wonderful kids. They're glorious kids. Brian is a wonderful man, but he's a vulnerable adult. And Alex Murdoch took advantage of this vulnerable adult. And it gnaws at me. And when I heard Mr. Wooders get up and, and go through the litany of crimes, I got nauseous. I'm sure I'm not the only one that got nauseous here. And so let's not delude ourselves. He's not just guilty of 22 crimes. He's guilty of all 102 of those crimes. And he will live knowing that he is guilty of those crimes. These boys, these men are wonderful Christian men, but their death of their mother was used to steal, to enrich himself at their expense. And, you know, I heard when he pled guilty, I wasn't in the courtroom a couple weeks ago. He used the words, I wrongfully obtained. That's not wrongfully obtained. He stole. He used the right word. He was a thief. He used the word and said, I misrepresented. No, you didn't misrepresent. You lied. That's what, that's what we have to talk about in this courtroom. He was a thief and he stole and he lied to these clients, those that are closest to him. He lied to his law partners. He lied to his own brother. $3.5 million of the $4.3 million that was recovered on behalf of the death of Gloria Satterfield, he stole, he took. And you heard Mr. Wooders, there's Mrs. Pickney coming in the courtroom. You heard Mrs., uh, Mr. Wooders say, he stole every dime, everything, every last penny from them. And, you know, I heard it said that, you know, Alex said, Two weeks ago, I'm really happy that I'm finally able to be pleading guilty, that I've been wanting to do this since September of 2021. No, you need to hear, Your Honor, what, what he has done since September of 2021 in order not to have accountability and in order not to accept responsibility for what he did. So 
when we discuss acceptance of responsibility, um, a lot of times that's part of the plea negotiations. And if you accept responsibility, they'll give you a lesser plea. I don't think that was big in this discussion. Um, we will get a lot of information on, um, on the plea negotiations when we get to the interviews. But as far as it's going on here, I think Eric Bland is doing a great job of highlighting just how bad this conduct is. So Creighton Waters later on feels like he has to explain why did they even make a deal? Why did they do 27 years served at 85%? Why did they do anything to give him anything less than life when theoretically you could have gotten life with three convictions on these kinds of crimes? And Creighton Waters, basically, there's one argument I 100% agree with and one I just don't agree with. The, the argument that I do agree with is we don't want to put these victims through trial, through the misery again. I agree with that and I understand. And it seems like the vast majority of the victims agree with this sentence. But the part I don't agree with is everybody who gets up there and says, this is the worst and the harshest penalty for any white collar crime in our area. Okay, great. Because this has to be one of the worst crimes ever white collar wise in your area. But if the penalty could be more, that means that the worst of the worst penalty should be for the worst of the worst white collar crime. We have different penalties for different crimes. Everybody understands that. So to say that this plea deal was the, you know, the harshest penalty we could get or that we've ever gotten in this area, that's fine and that's good, but you still could have gotten more. You could have gotten more. And so that's why that argument kind of falls flat to me. But the victims, if they didn't want to go through trial, I 100% get that. It's any compromise that you would make in a civil case, criminal case, no difference. You want to save your clients the misery of being re-victimized. And to me, that hits home. And I understand it. And as long as the victims are good with it, I'm good with it. Um, the harshest of penalties are meant for crimes like this, in my opinion. When we had the bond hearing, after the bond hearing, his lawyer said in a gaggle, that the Satterfield should look to others to get their money. They shouldn't look to Alex, that there's other people that are responsible for that. That was the start. We sued him civilly. He didn't answer the complaint and accept liability and deny damages, which he could have done. He denied liability. From 12, 21 through May of 22, we, my partner, Ronnie Richter and I negotiated a confession of judgment, the same confession of judgment that was introduced as I think exhibit 23 by uh, Mr. Waters for $4.3 million. The money that he stole, he accepted responsibility. Did he? You'll hear in a second, he did not. But that took six months to get a simple confession of judgment that should have been signed immediately. The murder trial, Mr. Harpootlin, who's a wonderful lawyer, best, probably one of the best our state has ever produced, denigrated this guy on cross-examination. He says, Ms. Harpoolian, who's probably one of the best lawyers our state has ever produced, and later Harpoolian's like, yeah, thanks a lot for that, but, and then he just kind of moves on, but it's funny, and I... For a lot of people that hate Dick Harpoolian, it seems like Eric Bland doesn't like him very much either. He is a good lawyer and you got to call a spade a spade when you see it. And I thought that that was interesting. And I know a lot of people in the chat disagree with that. They don't think he's a good lawyer. They don't like him. Um, I think he's a pretty good lawyer, uh, even if I don't like his client or I don't agree with everything that he says or everything that he argues. But I thought it was interesting when Eric Bland said that. Um, and again, talks about how great his clients are, which is the point of the victim impact statements is the victims. Saturday. Disrespect him. That's not a man that's accepting responsibility. That's not Alex Murdoch accepting responsibility. After the trial ended in March, Mr. Murdoch tried to add these two men to the federal court Nautilus action as party defendants. And it was said that if Nautilus wants any money, don't get it from Mr. Murdoch. You got to get it from these guys because Mr. Richter and I, we recovered money more than seven and a half million dollars for them, but from other sources. If that wasn't enough, and Judge Gergel denied that motion, that wasn't enough to stop him. In the summer, they filed a motion to vacate the confession of judgment that he gave to them in May of 2022. He signed his name. He had two really good lawyers help him negotiate the terms. It was notarized under penalty of perjury. But then he went and filed a motion in our state court trying to vacate that confession of judgment. Judge Price denied it in August, wrote an order that said, not happening. You gave The reason for him bringing up all this is, again, just to show that Alec Murdoch is the same as he was then. Now he's going to say what he needs to say and do whatever he needs to do to protect Alec Murdoch. That's the point. He never admits to anything. He always goes back on his word. That's the point of kind of going through 
the procedural history of some of the civil cases here, even though this is technically a criminal case. Carol, thank you for gifting a membership. Let's hit a couple questions here. Leah, it was very interesting. One of the victims mouthed, I do, when Murdoch said to him, I hope you know I would never hurt Mags or Papa. What was also interesting to me is it did seem a little bit like a lot of people in that courtroom were resigned to the fact that that murder trial might be happening again. They didn't seem incredibly confident about the two life sentences and they kept putting qualifiers in there that that might go away, which I think was very weird and, and interesting to say the least. Netwoman, I know during the case they'd want complex with murder and financial crimes. I was curious if trials always use the same attorneys. I They do separate trials, criminal and civil. So... Yeah, the criminal attorney, so if you mean Alec Murdoch, it's not unusual if you have a quasi-criminal civil case that your criminal lawyers also represent you um, in the civil case. But these civil plaintiff's lawyers are not prosecutors, although they do have this weird program here that they allow it in South Carolina that Alec Murdoch was a, a part of. But Eric Bland would never be the cross prosecutor on the criminal case, even though he was prosecuting the civil case. But on the defense side, a lot of times, because they are private lawyers, they'll have uh, the same criminal defense lawyers and civil defense lawyers. Martha, am I correct that he will serve 85% of 27 years? Yes, that is the plea deal. Just Rhonda, thanks for gifting five more memberships. David, freely, voluntarily, without coercion or duress, you're a smart man, you knew what you were doing. <clears throat> Did it end there? No. They appealed it. They appealed that. Did it end there? No. We were supposed to have a trial, but for his plea two weeks ago, what happened next? They attacked the jury pool in Buford County. Incapable, incapable of being objective and fair because of all the publicity, the pretrial publicity. They didn't end it there. So I do have a problem with that. I have a problem with that argument. Now he is saying legally correct and proper arguments to make should be held against Alec Murdoch in his criminal sentence. It's one thing trying to screw over the victims. It's one thing going back on a confession of judgment or saying that he's lying. It's another thing to say that the jury pool based on the motion we read where tons of them said they couldn't be fair and impartial. It's not like he was pulling it out of nowhere. And then he's about to get into the recusal motion as if those should be knocks held against Alec Murdoch and sentencing totally improper. If this was an actual open sentencing hearing where the sentence could be changed, I think those would be objected to. And I, I don't think those are proper um, sentencing discussions. Talk about the victims, talk about what he did to them, talk about how he lied to them. But to say that he had an objection because a lot of jurors said they couldn't be fair and impartial, or he thought Judge Newman should be a witness, which eventually Judge Newman, it sounds like, agreed with and stepped down. I just, that's the type of stuff where it's like piling on. But again, if anybody deserves to get piled on to, it's probably Alec Murdoch. There, they attacked you. They filed a motion to recuse you from hearing the Satterfield case, saying that you, who was given your time, your sweat, and your blood, that you were conflicted, that you made any appropriate statements out of court. So the answer is no. He didn't want to do that in September of 2021, like he said two weeks ago, or it was said in the courtroom. They did everything they could not to do. It. But the calendar forced the plea. The 102 charges forced the plea. And there was all this about pretrial publicity, that somehow I caused pretrial publicity and others and people who wrote about it and podcasters or whatever. Boy, is that rich. The defense attorney himself is a podcaster. He started a podcast after the murder trial. They went to CrimeCon and they talked for two days about the case. They've done press conferences. They've done documentaries. They've gone on TV. If there's any pretrial publicity, it's caused in part by them. And they still. I do like that qualifier that he said in part by then. And <laughs> I agree with him. And that's what we talked about in the take care of my emotion too. It's like, if you're going to point the finger at somebody else, be careful of a pot calling the kettle black situation. Um, now, I don't think the defense lawyer, I think it's easy to, to take this and conflate it from what the defense lawyers are saying, but I think what the defense lawyers are actually trying to argue is there is so much negative publicity, not that there is publicity, but that it's so overwhelmingly negative that it affected the jury pool. And sometimes it's like, sometimes the pre-trial publicity is negative because it's all bad about your client, but this was a softball for Eric Bland when they started calling him out for a podcast, knowing Jim Griffin started a podcast after this trial. And so he drove a truck through it, which any good lawyer would. And there are people in the chat, and I get it, that really don't like Eric Bland, that really don't like Harputlian. Lawyers have specific styles. Lawyers do things a, a certain way. 
Both of them are representing their clients to the fullest, in my opinion, and zealously advocating on behalf of their client, which is what lawyers are supposed to do. If they were just sitting in the corner doing nothing, not advocating, not pushing, not pressing when they need to for their clients, they wouldn't be doing a good job for their clients. Not making the legally proper and sufficient arguments they need to make to represent their clients that are afforded them of the law, they're not doing their job as lawyers. I think they are both doing that in this situation. Came before you to say that Mr. Murdoch couldn't get a fair trial. The Plyler sisters lost their mother and brother. Arthur Badger lost his wife and was left to raise five kids. And you heard $1.3 million. He didn't get that money for 10 years. Do you know what it would have meant to that man to raise five kids with an additional $1.3 million? Thomas Moore did Mr. Woodridge talk about. The state trooper. He stole $125,000 from a state trooper. The man needed the money to retire. He couldn't retire because he had to pay back medical bills because he didn't have the $125,000. Harpoolian objects here and just says, can he only talk about his clients, not other people's clients? Judge is like, yeah, and Bland moves on. Not, no, no big deal with this uh, objection. These clients couldn't assess risk. These two men couldn't assess risk. They couldn't navigate their way through the system. Even though Jordan Jenks is a council member um, in Hampton County, he couldn't navigate his way through the system. He was best friends with Alex since eight years old. Alex would have been the last person that Jordan would have thought would reach into his pocket and steal from him. He preyed on them like a wolf does a rabbit, Your Honor. Being a lawyer is everything to my partner and me. 35 years we've spent helping people. Every one of these lawyers here, Jim May, Justin, Bar Justin Bamberg, Mark Tinsley, we do it because we love to help our clients. It's a sacred trust. None of us ever look at our clients. I'm just skipping a little bit about how amazing lawyers are and how lawyers are so great and they love their clients. It's true, but some don't. And not every lawyer does it because they love their clients. A lot of lawyers do it for a lot of different reasons. One of them being money. Um, and, you know, it's, there's just a part of grandstanding that to me um, waters down what's happening here in that when this stuff happens to our client, it makes us sick and we want to go pound the person that did it to our client. And it doesn't have to do with us all the time. It doesn't always have to do with us. You know, and that that's one of the things with the victim impact statement is what makes this case different is I feel like in listening to Eric Bland and listening to Tinsley and a lot of the lawyers that spoke is the lawyers also felt victimized. The lawyers felt victimized because Alec Murdoch is a lawyer and he gave lawyers a bad name or proved people right about their stereotypes and lawyer jokes. Collar crime. It's a red collar crime. It's a red collar crime because it's, it includes lack of remorse, just a systematic pattern of taking from clients, taking from the Satterfields, taking from the Jenks, taking from the Plylers, taking from the Mannings. It, it never stopped. The only reason it stopped was because of the boating accident or it would have continued. Every client was transactional and he has done more damage to our profession. All the lawyer jokes that we lie, we steal, we double deal, we go back in chambers with you and we cut deals behind our clients back. He sent us back generations. Our state was a laughing stock until you got a hold of that murder case. So now the Satterfields have a judgment. It's, it's in stone. They withdrew their appeal. My clients want their money, Mr. Murdoch, when you plan on paying. They want that $4.3 million. I will never forget the words you used at the end of the murder sentence about how he will get visitors at night. It pierced me. And I'm here to tell you that Gloria Satterfield will visit him. That Alania Plyler and Hannah Plyler's mother and brother will visit him. So he reiterates the comments made by Judge Newman at sentencing about how all these people he hurt and all these people that um, he stole from, they're going to visit him at night. And he is reiterating that. I actually, um, oh, Eric Bland makes a ton of valid points. I, I was not saying he's not making valid points. Um, I will say though, I felt like Mark Tinsley, who we're going to listen to next, I felt like I found myself nodding my head a lot more to Mark Tinsley. And like, yeah, this is how I feel about it. This is a very unusual case. I'm not so sure he cares if people haunt him at night. I think he's already making the next plans for whatever's best for Alec Murdoch. That's what I think Alec Murdoch's doing. 
whether it's becoming a boss in prison, whether it's getting out after these 27 years and hiding money so it's there when he gets out, whether it's winning the, the appeal and writing a book about the double murder case, whatever it is, I think he's focusing on that at night, not thinking about all these people. That's just, that's just my opinion, but Mark Tinsley will say it better than I can, so we're going to listen to... We're going to listen to what Mark Tinsley says in a few minutes. All these people will visit him and let him know that it wasn't okay, that he's mis mis they used their trust and misused their trust, that he stole money from them. He will see them and they will visit him. And I your honor for hope that it was listen to what Ronnie to Ricker has to say. Don't forget to get out of state court for forgetting about the double murder charge. But oh, yeah. Out of the dominoes falling where they should. Don't forget, Judge Gerbil still has a sentence coming and it could be a consecutive sentence so that if he lives long enough, to get out of state court for forgetting about the double murder charge. But if he lives long Why would he say forgetting about the double murder charge? If I was him, right? If I was him, I would say a jury convicted him of the double murder charge. If he wins the appeal, they'll convict him again. So he's going to prison for the rest of his life. That's how I would say it if I was confident in it. But a lot of people during this sentencing kind of almost assumed maybe the double murder charge was not going to fit or stick. Enough and he walks out of state court, and it's a consecutive sentence, he's going to walk to a federal prison. And I feel good that he will never breathe a fresh breath of air ever again. So on behalf of my clients, Your Honor, I thank you for giving me the opportunity. I think my partner wants to say just a very brief word. I appreciate your time. <laughs> sir, thank you. Hey, please support, Your Honor. Yes, sir. I'm Ronnie Richter. I've been a lawyer in good standing at the bar of the state for 30 years now, Your Honor. I'm also a lifetime South Carolinian. What I want you to know about the clients that we represent is that they are the very best of us, that they are humble, that they're God-fearing, that they're honest, that they're hardworking. I've had a great career, but this has been the highlight of my career to try to restore some faith that was destroyed by that man in the clients that we serve. I want you to know this too about the clients that we serve. Um, none of them are victims. And, and I've heard the word said over and over, I'm even gonna disagree with my partner, but we don't have a victim in this courtroom. That the word connotes that some accident has happened, that some misfortune has befallen them, that they are not victims. Prey, Your Honor, prey is hunted. Prey is hunted by predators. Prey is taken when it's at its most vulnerable. But by any way of looking at what happened here, the people we represent are not victims. They are prey. And, and that man across the courtroom, by any measure, is a predator. And when I say to you that these folks represent the best of us, and I look across the aisle and I see Alec there, who was once a contemporary of ours, all I can think to myself is for all the, the power, the privilege, the entitlement that he was born into, that, I mean, for God's sake, all that was ever asked of the man is that you wake up and be Alec Murdoch every day. To have taken it so afoul is, is hard to reconcile. He's made his behavior complicated, but we figured out what he's done. He's tried to hide his true nature from us, but we figured out who he is. So the only question we're left with is why? And I'll suggest to the court this answer. It doesn't matter, because the only person who can answer that question is Alec Murdoch, and he's demonstrated himself to be quite the cunning liar. Your Honor, in the opening, uh, I heard Mr. Arputlian say something about T-shirts and bobbleheads, and, and that is unquestionably a shot at my partner, Eric Lamb, and I do want to address that to the court. I want you to know, Your Honor, that my partner has gained some very well-deserved notoriety for his courageous representation of our clients. And that yes, he has sold t-shirts and other merchandise. And that all of that, all of those proceeds have gone to charities, including the Wounded Warrior Project and others. No one came here today to sell a t-shirt. We came here today to finish a job. We came here today for justice. I really like that too. It was short and sweet to the point. He got his shots in that he wanted to get. He defended his partner. Um, I, I like Ronnie Richter. I do. People have said I golfed with him. I've never golfed with him. I said I would golf with him because he's a stick. I think he's like a scratch golfer. Uh, JP, is the 27 years consecutive or concurrent with to the life sentence? It's concurrent, I believe. Actually, I don't know. I don't remember what they said, but it doesn't matter. If he gets the life sentence, nothing else matters. But everybody's assuming that this 27 years is 27 years at 85% if the life goes away. If not, this doesn't really matter. Uh, Chillax, Netwoman is my mirror lawyer you know fan. I live in the city MV where she grew up. And I grew up in the city she now lives in. Also, I've had chronic pain for 22 years. Well, I'm glad we could find some community here and we can have the Mirror fans here. Netwoman is bringing 10 new members with her. We're going to have a really fun and different December members only live. John is already uh, planning it and it's it's going to be pretty fun. Um, okay, now I want to hear what Tony Satterfield has to say. Another one of my favorites. I mean, to me, when a victim stands up there and does what Tony Satterfield's about to do here, it hits hard. It hits hard to me. It's something we all need to hear because we always wonder how we would react in situations like this, the hardest of hard times um, where nobody would blame you for cursing everybody and hating everybody, but he doesn't do that. And to me, it hits home. I'm because when I talk to people like Jason who I'm talking to, 
Thank you. Um, I really don't have words. You lied. You cheated. You stole. Um, you betrayed me and my family and everybody else. And you did that. It cost my mom death, first of all. Um, you, a couple of October ago, you wrote a half-hearted, I'm sorry letter, um, which was half-hearted because your actions did not follow through that. You were really sorry. Um, so I'm going to read you. I have an apology. I'm sorry that you felt like you had to betray us, steal from us, cheat us, come out of us. Um, I'm sorry that your family has to now go through what they're going to have to go through the rest of their life because of your actions of what you did. Um, but I want you to know that I forgive you. Um, I will pray for you every day um, that God gets a hold of your heart. Um, and you may not know the gospel, so I'm going to share it with you. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's how people are able to forgive people and able to do right and able to pray for those who hurt them and do things to them. So my heart is with you. Uh, my prayers are with you. And I just wish the best for you. Not only is that healing for Tony Satterfield, it's also a positive thing to say to Alec Murdoch, but also the worst thing to say to Alec Murdoch, because that probably hurts a lot more than somebody yelling at him. Um, I would think is somebody actually caring for you and praying for you and loving you and showing you the type of love you don't deserve and forgiveness that you don't deserve. Um, I mean, that, that was, that was something to me. Um, all right. I am going to jump ahead a little bit to Mark Tinsley next. I don't know. Sure. The longer I do this, the more I realize I don't know. Um, I don't practice in this courtroom in terms of criminal defense cases. Uh, I don't understand why the label of a white collar crime is given to these crimes, to the predatory acts that, that befell all of these people. The money that they were owed was owed because of blood, sweat, and tears. Hakeem Pinkney needed his money. The Badgers, who I represent, six children, two, three, five, eight, nine, and 11, are left with a single father, and he stole everything. And so I stand up here to say that I believe in accountability. I don't know that justice is served here, and I don't know that that the punishment um, in this case is justified, and I don't want to be the odd man out. So I'll just keep it to myself and thank it. So he says, I'm not so sure justice is served in this case with this sentence, but I don't want to be the odd man out, so I'll just keep it to myself, even though he did say it. But listen, that's something I said right from the jump when we heard 27 years at 85%. I just, it doesn't feel like enough when there was, it's not the max. Listen, lots of penalties don't feel like enough, especially in murder cases and things like that. It doesn't feel enough. Nothing ever feels like enough. But there was a higher punishment in this case they could have gotten that they didn't get. So I don't think it's bad to feel like the punishment should have been worse. He admitted this. He did all this. Over a hundred crimes. Give him the max. But again, I understand the victims don't want to go through trial. That's a very important factor here. That is really important. But I really appreciated what Tinsley said there and what he continues to say. Ellick, you're a broken person. I don't think you're going to lie in bed at night and have people come to you. I don't think that those people matter. And I don't know when that happened. But clearly it happened where you matter more. And I feel bad for you as a result of that. I knew Paul and Meg. I knew you. A lot of people thought they knew you. Clearly we didn't. I don't think you've always been this way, but somewhere along the way, you became broken. And you've justified it. And he's justified it every step of the way. And I stand up here, Your Honor, to, to simply correct the record. They didn't steal $1.325 million from my clients. The bank didn't help. The, the bank was complicit in every step of the way in enabling Alec Murdoch to steal and pull this off. You asked about Eddie Smith. Eddie Smith was a check cashing scheme. Eddie Smith was being paid to cash checks, but that money is still out there, and he knows where it is. He didn't spend all that money on drugs. If he wants to be accountable, he wants to be uh, contrite, he ought to tell these people where their money is. That's not going to happen. The same as he's not going to lay in bed at night and think about the wrongs and feel sorry for what he did. I don't envy you in having your job and the decisions you make. I recognize that there's value in finality, and maybe this is the right decision. I respect your honor. I respect the system. I stand up here merely to correct the record that my people have not been made whole. We are going to continue to seek accountability from the people that enabled him, that helped him, that were complicit in the thefts of their money. And so that's the reason I'm here today. Thank you, Your Honor. I mean, that is an A plus from a PI lawyer. It was not just Alec Murdoch. From the very beginning, the very first video I ever did on this, I'm like, how does this happen with all these banks and sign offs and judges and guardians? 
how can what or is this really just one guy that did all this? And Mayor asked the question, Peter, will the victims get their money? So some of them have gotten some of the money from the law firm. Some have gotten it from Alex. Some have gotten it from insurance. Some have gotten it from banks. So different areas have they gotten some form of compensation, but they haven't been made whole and they're still seeking accountability, which I think is very important to continue to do. Dollface, drug addicts don't have emotion. They're not capable of understanding their ways. And I think that somebody mentions that um, about him being clean. I can't remember if it's in the interviews, but I'm sure we'll get to it. Um, all right, I do want to listen to a little bit of Mr. Jenks here because it was pretty powerful as well. This entire case. I <clears throat> I'm waiting on the state to look in your eyes. I wanted to sit down with you one on one. When I found out what you did, I just wonder why. Because you know, <clears throat> excuse me. Unlike a lot of these people here, these victims, I got a, a lot of intimate, intimate stuff that I can say. You remember all those wildlife hunts I had for law enforcement? Your entire family was the guest of honor. Mr. Buster, Judge Eldroff, insisted on me taking care of them for the day. You don't know how many brownie points you've got in my life from just that. Just did you get everything? I knew I was gonna break. I knew. Mr. Black, can you reposition his mic? You remember making a comment to me after I found out, after we discussed the possible amount this lawsuit was worth, and you made a comment to me, and you said, don't spend all this money foolishly. Tell me what you did with $20 million that you stole. This is one of his lifelong friends, basically, who he had a case with and stole all of his money. Part of it being mine. And you know, I'm sitting there crying. I want everybody to know. Judge, I need you to know. I'm not crying because of what he stole from me. I'm crying for what he did to everybody in the suit. These kids, these people dying. I didn't want to come up here and bash you, but I got to ask you. What kind of animal are you? I, I can't even I can't even go over my notes. I'm not here to be your judge. Ultimately, that belongs to the good Lord and Savior. But may He have mercy on your soul. I didn't want to see you when I saw you on TV in an orange jumpsuit. Hurt me. Still, what mad at you? But this judicial system put together a system to deal with people that make bad choices, and my friend. You chose to make the choice you made. So I need the judge to know that I am full favor. I am in full favor of the court's recommendation for the 27 years. I can go back to us going to mediation. That you affected my wife. You chose to have Maggie deal with us those two days we were in Charleston in mediation. She catered to us hand and foot. You told me where to go and check in my room. We People seem surprised that he stole from childhood friends. If you go back to the trial and you listen to them explain how he stole money from burn victims, from people whose loved one dies, from people he's known his whole life, childhood friends, adult friends, people who lost limbs, literally people in the worst position of their life, most vulnerable position of their life that needed the money to survive, not to get rich, but to survive. And he stole it and all of it. We did. From that point, we never drove another foot. Neither did you. Maggie drove us everywhere we went. When all this came about, Paul, Paul, and Maggie, I couldn't believe it. I didn't believe it. But after sitting here today and hearing some of the devious things that you did to people, these victims here, it changed my mind, bro. Once again, I ask you, what kind of animal are you? Boy, I gave you my all. I would do the money you stole from me. You could have asked me for it and I would have gave it to you. If that's how I felt about you and your family, you didn't have to steal it from me, man. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like the kind words, I feel like cut deeper. I, I really do. 
Dollface said, my apologies about the drug addict statement. I base my assumption on my experience with multiple drug drug addicts in my family. I apologize if it offended anyone. I think that's the point is just like any juror that goes on a jury, they bring life experience and personal experience into it. And we all learn from talking to each other and getting everybody's perspective. And that's why, you know, having a diverse and different background of people all come together and discuss this stuff is educational and we can all kind of grow and learn from each other. We don't always agree, but we can always learn. Love, thank you so much. Gifting 20 memberships, 20 memberships. But yeah, this guy, this guy hits hard. And I still, if there's any way possible, you set it up for me to be on your visitation list. I want to sit down with you. I want to look you in your eyes and talk to you when I can really talk to you. We got some intimate things we can talk about. I mean, that's wild. Like, he just really wants to talk to him. He still cares about him. And Alec Murdoch in his speech says he does want to talk to him and he'll talk to all the victims if they'll talk to him. Why, bro? Why? Such a talent. Do you know what you just threw away? How talented you are? I don't know. Mr. Harpoonian, nothing to do with you, but you made a comment earlier about attorneys trying to sell bobbleheads and cups. Can you represent this man to sell those bobbleheads and cups to repay the victims that he stole from? Thank you. He said, hey, uh, Dick, you made the comment, no disrespect, but maybe you guys could sell some bobbleheads and cups and you could pay back some of these victims. How about that? Why don't you try doing that? Thank you, Rebecca. It's tough. It's it's always tough, but that's why this is a really good group in this chat. We we really learn a lot from each other in this chat. Um, all right. Now it's time for the show here for Alec Murdoch. Uh, Creighton Waters got up and again kind of explained why they're even making a deal at all. Uh, but now is the time for us to hear from the man himself. I can only take so much of it. A lot of it is repetitive, but I do want to hear him talk to some of the victims. We are going to skip the part where he again denies ever hurting Maggie and Paul and Buster and my friends and my family and all this stuff that has nothing to do with the victims of these financial crimes. Yet he went on for like 20 minutes talking about them, which I thought was very interesting that he focused a lot more of his time on talking to his family and his friends and the people he maybe actually cares about and not as much time on the victims, but he does talk about the victims, so we'll we'll listen to that part now. Yes, sir. Um, I want all of, each of you that spoke uh, to know that I listened to you. I heard you. Your pain and your hurt is palpable. I get it. It's reasonable, and I promise you that it resonates with me. I understand it. I hope that time will come. And you can look back and know that despite the things that I did, that I care about each one of you. Because I do. I did. Terrible things. Each of you placed your trust in me. I was very proud of that. And I'm still today honored by that fact. That I see each of you. Terrible. I did terrible things. Things I'm thinking about right now cause me to be hurt. Cause me to be disturbed. It is so important to me that you know how bothered that I am by the things that I did. That is important to me. After hours, days, weeks, months of self reflection, I know now that I took more and more and more pills. Because I was hiding, attempting to. So he's sticking to it. That's his story, and he's sticking to it. It was the pills. He spent it all on the pills. Mark Tinsley, I think, blew a hole in that, but he's sticking to it. He didn't hurt Maggie and Paul, and it was all about the pills. Tinsley's not even looking at him. I have special recollections of my interactions with each one of you outside of the terrible things that I did. <clears throat> JJ, I felt 
I'm as close to you as anybody. I still do. As anybody I can think of. We grew up together. Yeah, dude, that's why we're all like Jay baffled by this. Fish <clears throat> together, alone, all over the low country. I mean, I think we talk to each other about everything that's important for both of us. And man, I hate the things that I did. My daddy's one of the best of friends. I mean, I mean it. When I say that I care about you, as hypocritical as that seems in light of the things I did, it is so very true. I did care about each of you, and I still care about each of you. Um, Michelle, I can't think of a bad day that a hug from Miss Carrie and a kiss from Miss Carrie. She would always give when I would see the two of you, because I never saw one without the other. But that wouldn't make better. And it was usually accompanied by some sage advice or words of wisdom that were always so perfectly appropriate for whatever was going on. I truly love her, and I love you. And I am so sorry. Um, there's so many others that aren't here today uh, that I hope will listen, will be listening one day, like Dion. Dion's daddy, one of my dearest friends. I can still remember going to Dion's graduation, spending time with him. One more thing, JJ, going back, I do want to tell you as to how close I feel to you. My wife loved you, and you are absolutely right about everything you said, but you are dead wrong about one thing, and I would never hurt Maggie, and I would never hurt Paul. And it is important to me that you know that. Because she did love you. And he did say, I do. So that somebody pointed that out earlier. So he did say, I do. Hard to tell if he was saying, I do, based off of, um, I do know Maggie loved me, or I do know you wouldn't hurt them. k Rab said he told a woman her three children... Letter Horson were worth 10k each, but got 100k, kept the 10k as fees, stole the rest. She got nothing. I mean, there's 102 stories just like this that are despicable. Um, an ear hair from Bezos. How much of what he is saying has he said to the victims when they were his clients? And does he actually hate what he did? He hates that he got caught, and he's saying it all of it now that he got caught. I mean, that's I think what everybody's kind of feeling the same way. Dollface, I feel like Alex is tweaking. He smacks his lips like my sister used to. Um, I do have it sped up, so it could be because I have it sped up. And if anybody wants to slow it down, you just hit that gear thing on yours and slow it down to 0.75 speed, and that'll make it the normal one-time speed. I always, or I'm sorry, 0.5 speed because I'm on 1.5. And I hope you know that. Yeah, I hope you know that. I mean what I say here today. Um. Jamie Fisher, man, Damien's uncle and daddy was close to me and my daddy. How many classes in glory are like a part of my family? And I mean that as hypocritical as that sounds, and me saying it, as hypocritical as it sounds, it is the absolute truth. That does bring me to a point, and I will say that I say to Mr. Um, <coughs> Mr. Bland, Maggie and I raised our two boys with input from her mom and dad and input from my mom and dad. But we are the people who raised those boys. Probably an unnecessary shot to take, but what was really interesting about that is I didn't realize this the first time through. He either acted like or actually didn't know Eric Bland's name, and one of his lawyers had to tell him Bland he kept saying Mr. Mr. So I don't know if that was just a shot at Eric Bland. Like, I don't even know who this guy is, but I mean, probably didn't need to like make that clarification that Gloria didn't help you raise your kids. Again, I think that shows kind of his true colors in his statement that he's only willing to admit certain things and he is going to push back no matter how despicable it sounds when he feels he's right about something. And also, now, with that being said, Eric, with that being said, there is no person no person, period, that was more important to my family than Gloria was. To all of us. To me, especially to Maggie, to Paul Paul, Lord, 
Lord knows he adored her. And I hope you know that. And Buster, and me too. I told her, and I'm so sorry, so sorry for the things that I did. And it is important to me that you know how sorry I am for the things that I did to each of you. All my law. It literally goes for like another 40 minutes as I just scanned across, but I think we've heard enough. You get it. He apologized. He denied anything with the murder charges. Um, and he basically gives some advice to his son that it, just because I did this doesn't mean you do. It's not how we raised you, blah, 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 honestly. But at the end of the day, it was an apology. Whether you think it was real or fake, I do want to listen to um, what Judge Newman thinks about this apology because Judge Newman's the one that's going to be handing down the sentence, and we get a good idea about how he feels about Alec Murdoch's apology and what he thinks Alec Murdoch really thinks and really believes and the type of criminal that he compares Alec Murdoch to, which, yikes. Uh, your life will continue. Uh, I will turn the page and uh, uh, the murder cases. 2021, when the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court assigned me to preside over the pending investigations uh, involving um, the various offenses that um, you are being investigated for, uh, initially including these financial crimes and um, and the um, the murder cases. Uh, and I have lived with this case now for over two years, and um, I have 34 days left before active retirement. And after uh, imposing this sentence, uh, your life will continue. Uh, I will turn the page and uh, leave you behind. He's like, uh, when we're done, you keep going on your life and fighting, you know, your charges and all your, all your, all your jail time. I'm going to turn the page and leave you behind. I'm going to go enjoy my retirement. You don't affect me. Nothing you file or say or do, or your lawyers file, say or do is going to affect me. Um, and that just is what it is. And I thought that was kind of a nice shot there by judge Newman to say, I'm done. I'm retiring. I don't care. Like you're in prison for two life sentences and now 27 more years. Good luck. You're quite an, an enigma, uh, a person that many of us thought we knew. Um, and as I stated earlier, I can only recall you as being a fun, loving, happy person. I've never, uh, I've never seen you say it. I've never seen you um, being anything other than a friendly, caring person. And uh, it's so disappointing uh, to see you again in this setting. I believe the last time we saw each other and you were not in jail was at, at a conference when you were poolside having a good time. And as it turns out, that was a couple of months after the passing of your wife and son. Um, but you were having a good time. Uh, made nothing of it. And, and then the uh, Labor Day weekend events occurred. And um, next thing I know, I'm assigned to preside over all of your matters. And again, he's, he's really making a, a point as to why he thinks Alec Murdoch has this horrible character. Courtney, could the judge put a stop to that long speech? He could, but it would be very unusual. And again, he wasn't doing anything over the top, you know, yelling at somebody, cursing at somebody. So he let it ride. Paw printed heart. There's an old saying, never do business to family or friends. They're the first to screw you. That's so true in this case. Maybe, and I know a lot of people that do live by that. And I just disagree with it personally. Um, especially if I'm going to give money to somebody or pay them for a service or hire somebody. I like to do it for family and friends to help people I know and believe in and trust and want to do life together with. So I, I don't necessarily, and I have a lot of family and friends that hire me as well. And I try to do my best for everybody, um, family and friends or otherwise. So I don't necessarily live by this myself, but I understand it has definitely happened to people. I think some people do know their family and friends well enough to know they shouldn't work with them. But um, I think that's a case by case basis not on your matters, but uh, others as well. And we started out with 100, over 100 charges, indictments against various folks. And uh, we whittled that down to just a handful. Um, outstanding. And uh, I'm happy to turn the page and turn, uh, not, not turn the remnants over to anyone else, but to certainly turn over anything pending against you to someone else. It's been AKA said that the these murder stuff. white collar offenses. I've never had that distinction. I've never thought of it that way. Uh, I've looked at criminal offenses as criminal offenses. 
you know, three property crimes in South Carolina is a, you, you can get 10 years in prison. People have gotten 10 years for shoplifting, third offense. Uh, I've sent people into retirement for committing of criminal offenses over and over and over again. Uh, I never thought of it as being a white collar offense. Uh, have had employees do embezzlement, um, church secretary stole money, a preacher stolen money, um, many offenses. Uh, but I didn't never draw a distinction between a, a violent crime uh, and other crimes. Uh, certainly the law makes a distinction and uh, many violent crimes are non-parole offenses. Uh, the plea I'm accepting with you, uh, you must serve 85% of the time. The parties have indicated that they are uh, the, the victims uh, to the extent that they can be called victims there. That's my preferred term for, for the group of people who have been preyed upon or victimized. Uh, they've all indicated that they would like for the court to accept the negotiated. He did a really good job too. I didn't notice the first time around the judge of being sensitive to what everybody said is because legally speaking, these are white collar crimes. Legally speaking, these are victims. So I understand why people don't like those terms, but legally speaking, that is what they are. But I like how he kind of couched in like, you know, I never thought about the, you know, calling them white collar crimes and these victims that were preyed upon because Ronnie Richter said, you know, they're prey, they're not victims. So I appreciate how the judge did that. Um, uh, Karen, does a sentence start now or after his murder sentence is over? So it starts now. There was some discussion over the 500 plus days of time served credited and whether or not that should count. Um, it, whether or not when he started serving time for the double murder, if that should count against his time served, they basically said, we'll calculate that stuff later. Rebecca, I never give away money. I can't afford to lose good words to live by in my book. You know, a lot of people say this was like gambling and betting that if you're going to gamble something, just assume you're going to lose it and you got to be able to afford to lose it. Cause if you don't, then it really becomes a problem. Um, but yeah, I mean, never, never stretch yourself past your means for sure is a good life lesson to live by. It is sentence. Uh, it is a, uh, a stern sentence. Um, the question was asked, what kind of animal are you? Um, you're an enigmatic person. Um, I don't know that you understand yourself. Um, what comes to mind is the young man that I'm sentenced to death penalty for killing a police officer and setting his body on fire. And though personally I was opposed to capital punishment, uh, he was sentenced to death. And in writing up that sentence report, I, I concluded that he was heartless. He was just empty. And when I see you and I listen to you, and I reflect on all that I've seen since being appointed, uh, assigned to these cases. Uh, you come closest to that young man being empty. I don't see anything. I, I tried to reach you at, at sentencing in the other case. Uh, I, I've listened to you here today. So he compares him to somebody that committed that horribly, just tragic, brutal crime and said, that's kind of who I'd compare you to. I tried to reach you at sentencing and I just couldn't. And again, the disappointment and the I see through you that Newman is trying to get across to Murdoch, I'm sure is eating away at him. Um, and I don't, I don't see anything there. Hopefully, hopefully something will emerge within your spirit, within your soul. Uh, certainly um, being a person of your age and intelligence and experience, you have a lot to offer to the people that you encounter on a daily basis in the institution. And I think it's admirable that you, um, you've indicated that you will uh, help them and continue to try to do good uh, by them. And he said, you know, I hope you do help people because Alec Murdoch said to the judge, judge, I am working on being a better person. I do want to be a better person. And he says, hopefully you can help people in the institution because you know a lot of things that um, could be helpful to them. Uh, you'll certainly have a lot of opportunity to do that. You know, as we look at all of us, you know, none of us are perfect. Um, many of us do things that we shouldn't, uh, shouldn't do. Um, it's just unimaginable, unimaginable to me that you have done some of the things that you've done. And um, whether it's you or someone you become upon using drugs or through the process of, of just committing crimes over and over, um, over the period of years, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know who I'm speaking to now. Um, but being a person of power and influence, um, 
in question is raised of what type of character do you have? Um, a person who would prey upon folks who are vulnerable and uh, who are of a lower perceived estate than you. Um, how you would prey upon those people, people who you say you love. Um, and you would capitalize on a disparity of, of what you have versus what they had and what they need and what they desired. You know, in my years, I could. I, I know of no greater joy as a lawyer that I've had during my 47 years as a lawyer than the joy of giving, uh, of having a satisfied client, of delivering good results for a client, and and experiencing that joy with them. Uh, I can I can think of no greater joy um, than I've experienced and and being able. To as a lawyer, I agree. I mean, that is the best. Even big, I mean, even some like big cases, obviously small cases though, like there's no case that at the end when your client is really happy that it doesn't just fill you up basically as a lawyer where they're like, wow, I was able to help them. They appreciated the skills I brought to the table. Um, they realized, you know, maybe they couldn't do it without me and I was able to help them through something that they couldn't manage on their own. There's really nothing better about that. Able to deliver on behalf of a client. Uh, and I'm sure you've experienced that joy as well. Until it's until you decided that the only joy you're concerned about was your own. Yep. I, I take no joy at all in uh, imposing this sentence, um, but it is what it is. And you'll have to suffer the consequences of your acts. Continue to suffer the consequences, and um, and hopefully um, some good will come out of you. As you move forward, there, these are there are a number of counts here, a number of indictments, and you'll get an individual sentence. All right, we're going to skip him reading through all the counts again, giving him 27 years. Um, Harputlian says at the end, Judge, it was nice being in front of you. And the judge kind of hesitates and then was like, oh, It was nice having you work. It was nice working with you too. And, and Harputlian says, Oh, Judge, it's fine. You're not under oath. You don't have to say that. It was so funny. It was so funny. satisfied to get this. All right. Now we get to the post sentencing interviews where we get to get a little behind the scenes action and we get some answers of things that a lot of you had questions about, which I think is, is really going to be interesting to dig into here for the last few minutes of the video. Um, the only statement we have is that Alex is satisfied to get this behind him. It's a substantial sentence. He understands that. Um, and he looks forward to a hearing on uh, a, our motion to set aside his murder conviction based on jury tampering. And before you ask me, no judge has been appointed. We, this is the Supreme Court. We don't know when they'll appoint a judge, and we don't know when the hearing is going to be. So let me save you those questions. Jim? You know, obviously, Alec had a lot to say to, in court today, and he took full advantage of the opportunity. Um, and so, you know, I don't have anything more to add. Any questions? With this sentence alone, you expect Alex to spend the rest of his life in No. I mean, with this sentence, he will be eligible to be released. And max out at like 75 and a half. He's 55. So now he gets, he gets credit for time served. He's already challenged me to a golf game. I'll be 86, so he'll probably win if I live that long. But no, he's, I tell you, Alec is committed to getting out. One thing that came, you know, I don't want to count our chickens before the eggs hatch, but a lot of the lawyers in there spoke, didn't, didn't express a lot of confidence that he was going to have to do two life sentences without parole. So I mean, that, was that was pretty interesting because he's not wrong. There was a lot of comments that were kind of like waffling about the life sentences. And Alex looking forward to being out when he's 75 years old and he's already challenged him to a golf match. So by the way, um, somebody said, I draw, I fast forward to the part where Poot dropped the F bomb. I must've missed that. Oh, he dropped it right before he started the interview. All right. Sorry. Uh, if you wanted to see it. Um, but just like we said, Alec Murdoch challenging Jim Griffin, his lawyer to a golf match when he's out, when he's 75 years old, tells you what Alec Murdoch's thinking about, Right. That's what Alec Murdoch's thinking about. He's not thinking about these victims. He's not thinking about Maggie and Paul, in my opinion. And we get to hear it through the scenes a little bit. Rebecca said, that's what it's like being an ER nurse. Well said. Yeah, helping people. Honestly, helping people. That's, that's you know, what gives you the joy and is so satisfactory that we heard from Bland and all the PI lawyers in there today. It's hard to hear these know. questions, Anything by the way, about. so we're just going to get we're just going to get the answers, which is fine. Uh, 
We don't know anything about any of the facts involving that case. So we can't, we're not going to. Actually, so the question was about Becky Hill's son's wiretapping charges. And he's like, we're not going to answer anything about that. We don't know. We don't know, you know, what's going on there. And it's a pending case. We're not going to comment, comment on that. Yes, ma'am. They skip because of the ambulance sounds. Yes. Not going to tell you. Because we're still investigating it. And first of all, we got to get a new trial. I mean, you're going to black cat me here. We need to go ahead and deal with the jury tampering issue, get a new trial, and then that would be a valid question. Well, most of these folks have been already gotten restitutions, either from the law firm or insurance companies. Yeah, it's the Alec that that I've spoken to since September of 2021. He immediately expressed remorse then, and he expressed remorse today. And, 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 you know, we met him when Paul was charged with the boat case, and we both spent a lot of time with him and Maggie and Paul. I mean, that's the Alex before he was ever charged, before he was ever accused. I mean, he's always been, when I say straight up, pretty. Alex always been straight up, number one, number two, but he was taking a million pills a day back then, but now he's clean. I thought he was a different man now, and now they're saying he's exactly the same. A lot of these comments to me are kind of fishy. Like, I, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Pretty honest with us. about, but he, but he is clean today, and he's been clean for over 800 days, and believe it or not, it's pretty easy to get drugs in prison, and so he, he's proud of that stuff. The two, two, well, one, blame us, because we've got to investigate, and we have to make motions. We have to go through this process. Two, he, as he said, he didn't get a, a real plea offer until, what, three weeks ago? Yeah, I mean, early November. You, know, you plead guilty, you get life without parole. That was the offer. And, and then when we finally got ready to... That's basically what we were guessing, is that they were never offering him anything less than life. So you can either go to trial and get life, or you can take a plea deal and get life. And so defense lawyers are never going to take the max in a plea deal, which is why you have to go to the trial to get to the max. But they're not going to give us any insight on the plea deals, but or the plea offers, but just wait, it's coming in another interview. Try this case, the Attorney General's office became more reasonable and we went back and forth and ended up 27 years. And they're like, well, we were willing to try the case and you know, we took it to them and that's why they gave us 27 years. Playing it, I shouldn't say playing it, angling it as a win for him and his client. Of course, Creighton Waters comes and gives him his interview and he's like, oh, they didn't want to do this. We pushed them. We had all the leverage. We forced them to take 27 years, which is way more than they ever wanted to take. So both sides come and basically pound their chest and say, we won, which is what a lot of sides do in every case that settles or every case that pleads, every end of a case, both sides act like they won, which both sides also can feel like they won and feel like they lost, which is usually what happens in a compromise. Well, the sentence is 85% of 27 years. Y'all can do the math. I mean, that he'd be 75, 76 years old. Yeah, so I'm going to be 75 next month. We're not sure he's going to make it, but I, I, you know, I don't right. feel like I'm going to die. So, anyway. so basically, when he gets out, he's going to be Poot's age. We're not going to, those are negotiations. We're not going to get into that. But something less than 27, and they were asking for something more than 27. Anything else? What? I, I, I believe in Santa Claus. I mean, you know, there's no money there. He wouldn't be borrowing money from his law partners, from his brother, from his, from everybody. And, you know, if there's money there for him, I mean, that's... If the whole pattern of his borrowing and spending would indicate he's, he was spending the money on something, we believe drugs. And if you look at the checks just written to Eddie Smith um, and other people we know he bought drugs from, it's almost $5 million of money that was written to the drug dealer or written to drug dealers. And, um, you know, and the rest was spent on paying back loans. I mean, look, if you go through it, there's no extra money there. Anything else? Have a great day. See you when you're free. So basically, they're sticking to the fact that September 21, there was no, the there's no money to have. Resources yeah. led, um, allocated, and like my partner says, until your shoulders are pinned in the middle. Um, you know, I meant every word that I said today. I think that um, he's a very, very dangerous, evil man. I, this was nothing but a PR stunt for him. Uh, if the murder case somehow gets reversed, that he could try to reshape his image. Uh, he didn't do a good job of it in the in the murder case uh, during the murder trial. But, you know, it's a sad day. J Justin Bamberg was correct. You know, as a lawyer, I hate this. I hate that it happened. It said there, there's former Attorney General Charlie Condon. He knows as a lawyer, it, it, we have to. And I can tell you this, that 
Creighton came to me uh, about a month ago and said, All right, here we go. Here's where he's going to talk about the plea deals. He said Creighton came to him about a month ago and started discussing this stuff with him. Would you, be, would you object if the sentence was 27 to 30 years? He said, Our building is never going to take it, but we have to. Judge Newman wants, to, wants us to explore whether we can get a resolution. In all cases, there's always a time when you, when you explore a resolution. Civil cases, it's mediation or before you go to the courthouse, et cetera. And he said, and he said, Water said somewhere between 27 and 30 years. Poot's never going to take it. Um, so again, feeling like a win on the victim side, on the AG side. Would you be objecting? Would you have an objection to a 27 to 30 year sentence? And uh, I did the math. He's 54 years old. I know how many years somebody lives in maximum security. I knew that Judge Gergel had a backstop sentence. It's coming in a couple months for the federal crimes he pled guilty to. Plus, there's the uh, Labor Day shooting. Plus, if the murder charges stick. Um, so he's again, the last thing he mentioned is if the murder charges stick, which is interesting to me. Um, it seems like they're more banking on the federal sentence being consecutive, and we'll see if they do that. I said, uh, I said, no, I don't have an objection. I talked to the clients, um, and no one said, no, we want him in life. Um, but the point is that Harpootlian, he said, would never agree, and they did not. They did not want Alex to plead to anything more than 14 to 15 years. And, you know, God bless the attorney general. So there's the answer. What did Murdoch want? 14 to 15 years. That's what he wanted. So 27 is basically double that. So again, seems like a loss for Murdoch and a win for the AG's office. What do you guys think? John, why don't you throw up a poll here for the last few minutes of our, of our video? Is 20, let's just say, who won the plea deal? Murdoch or the AG's office? Who won the plea deal? Because both sides are coming up saying, ha we won, we got this, we got what we wanted. He's going to be 75 playing golf soon, be out of prison. The other side saying, oh, he's definitely going to die, or we have a consecutive uh, felony sentence, or we have, you know, the two life sentences might stick. What does the chat think? What do you guys think? Who won this plea deal? General Alan Wilson and my hero, Craig Waters, they never yielded. They never went below 27 years. So uh, I'm real proud of the state. Uh, I'm proud of that sentence. Because it leaves out some of the victims that were part of those charges. That wasn't our case. We got it from other sources. But it is true that the law firm did step up to the bar and make a lot of those people whole. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. There's going to come a time um, where books are written. I think there's going to come a time when uh, people that um, have protected Alex for so long, whether it's Corey Fleming who's going to have to talk, whether it's Russell Lafitte. Remember, Russell's doing 84 months. Curry, Corey's going to end up doing close to 9, 10 years. Um, maybe somebody's going to talk. Alex himself, on a federal level, to take that plea, has to go under a polygraph test, and there's no limitations on the questions. So um, I'm sure they're going to ask him a ton of questions, and somebody may come clean with a conscience who's holding money for Alex. I believe some of it's buried in cash because he gave Cousin Eddie cashier's checks to cash, but I also believe there's a lot of land partnerships where he held an interest that wasn't based. Again, just kind of saying there's still money somewhere. There's still money. He's got to have money still. Uh, Rebecca's bouncing off to work. How about those Cowboys memberships to keep the boys winning? Ooh, she's going to be at the Eagles game. Bet that's going to be cold. You're going to have to report back, Rebecca, on how that went. And then she gifted 10 memberships on her way out. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Because that had nothing to do with it. To, 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 again, that's the defense complaining about the media, podcasters, pretrial publicity. They created as much of it themselves. There isn't a microphone or a camera that Dick Harbutin won't go in front of. And he busted on podcasters, and I am a podcaster. And right after the murder trial, his partner starts a podcast. So, it's, you know, it's a pot calling the kettle black all the time. Don't bust on podcasters. Come on. Don't bust on podcasters. You guys were crime con celebrities. Come on, Poot. Don't bust on podcasters. Eric Bland wasn't having any of that. Wasn't having any of that. All right, let's jump to um, just a few minutes of what Creighton Waters and team had to say here, and then we will finish our video. Everybody ready? All right, well, <clears throat> this has obviously been a very uh, great day, I think, for justice in South Carolina. Uh, obviously, Alec Murdoch has pled guilty to these financial offenses from the state grand jury, uh, and he's uh, been sentenced to a uh, sentence of 27 years of 85% time. 
Uh, this was something that the state agreed to for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, again, a sentence that I think Judge Newman called very stern. Uh, I don't think anyone, uh, as I said in court, the state or federal has seen a sentence like that for charges of this nature. Uh, but additionally, we're able to save these victims, uh, save these communities, the expense of trial after trial, and ultimately get to tell the entire story of how Alec Murdoch abused uh, the judicial system, how we made use of his power and his influence in this law license to do so. Uh, and I think that's a big important uh, point of this today as well, is to have that exposed, have that addressed in state court where it belongs, and have the state. So I see a lot of people saying, oh, he's, he's never going to get out because of the federal charges. Probably, but there is a world in which they could run consecutively. I'm sorry, concurrently. So if the federal and state crimes run concurrently because they're based on similar acts and he does overturn the murder charge and then doesn't get convicted, a lot of big ifs, there is a sliver of a chance he gets out at 75. I mean, there is a chance now for him where if they would have tried these cases, there would be no chance no matter what happened with those murder charges. That's what I kind of expected to happen. So I'm a little surprised. I can't wait to see what the poll results end up being when we're done with this clip. State court system, speak on it, and then begin its own process of healing and improving from the experiences that this case has uh, brought to us. I want to thank, of course, the Attorney General, Alan Wilson, who's been uh, instrumental and in leadership in this case from the beginning, and also my partners at SLED, uh, my state grand jury team. You see a couple of them standing right here. I've got Johnny James and Carson Burney, who are my two uh, financial white-collar uh, guys who do such a great job, among so many others, uh, at SLED and among the state grand jury staff. And uh, they've really been instrumental in all of this. And then I also want to thank, as I did in court, uh, the victims, and particularly those initial victims and their attorneys who, uh, who came forward. Some of them were unrepresented at the time, uh, but they really showed a lot of courage uh, in this case early on. Uh, it's really hard to conceive of it now uh, that we're kind of on the other side of this part of the tale. Uh, but at the beginning, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, difficult feelings as to whether or not anything would ever be done. And we're happy that this result that today has shown that it will be. Uh, so I'll take a couple of questions if anybody has any. Yeah. Well, again, we got 27 years at 85 percent in our judgment. That is practically a life sentence. Uh, and again, we're talking about, you know, what college and endure. That's a small county. They had to endure an incredible expense. And I think you heard Justin Bamberg talk about that, that all of these smaller counties, uh, Allendale, Hampton, Bamberg, would have to pay for trial after trial after trial. And that's not a good use of judicial resources, uh, not only for the judicial resources in those counties and to have all those neighbors and friends of those victims have to. We talked about all this a bunch, too. Like, is it should they even try all these cases? And they took all that into account when coming up with. And, and there's a little insight into why they picked the numbers they picked. They felt like it was essentially a life sentence. Eric Bland even said that he knows how what life is like in these maximum security prisons, and he doesn't think he's going to last 20 years. So he put the bill for those trials, but it's not a good use of court time or really time for a uh, sled in the attorney general's office. As I said in court today, and I loved uh, Justin Bamberg's slay the dragon analogy, we have a lot of other dragons to, uh, to slay. We had a big announcement last week on some of our cases involving uh, some of the issues at SCDC, some of the corruption there. We even announced where a child had been victimized in real time through use of a contraband cell phone. Another big focus at state grand jury is fentanyl trafficking, which is killing our citizens right and left. So if we can today put Alec Murdoch in prison, where he also waives his appeals, waives his PCR, and provide that level of certainty and finality, and be able then to move on to new things with a, a certainty that he's going to be in prison for the rest of his life regardless of what happens with the murders. And let's be clear, he's got two life sentences for murder and those aren't going away. We're going to litigate that. And if we, for some reason, some small chance we have to retry it, we'll do that as well. Uh the first guy that's been confident in it. So I like the way he said it. That's what I would say. You won. It's hard to overturn convictions. You won. Act like it. You know, that's why I want all these people to act like it. it's like you guys won and he finally did right there. So he thinks they're going to stick. Um, we'll see what happens. But I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then he goes on to continue to talk about you know, there are other cases that they have going on and other bad guys to get, other dragons to slay. And that was another sentencing in the books, the end of another case and chapter here. Probably not the end of the Murdoch saga, saga but at least the end of the state uh, white collar financial crimes. Crystal said, anyone else think we should look into Dick and Jim? Um, I, I don't think I don't think they're going to get their hands dirty with Alec like that, but I don't know. Rebecca going to sleep, worked 16 hours yet wanted to catch us live. Best channel. Thank you, Rebecca, for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, for everybody that came and that joined us, um, it's been a wild ride. Um, I've got to sign off now. More overtime. Seems like the videos are getting longer and longer. we got to trim them back down to one hour. But I appreciate you guys so much. Please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We're so close to 300,000 subscribers. I really want to try to get there before the end of the year. That's the goal. Um, and hit that like button if you haven't already. But that's all we got for now. Until next time, I hope everybody has a beautiful day. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. 
And don't forget to check out the Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, the lawyer you know.